Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we use psychology secrets to boost our well-being? And I'm in conversation with Aidan Harvey Craig. Hi, I'm Aidan Harvey Craig and I am currently um, Head of Psychology at um, a, an international school in Malawi. Uh, and I've been out in Malawi for three years. Uh, and uh, my family, I've got two teenage daughters and my wife, we, we moved out here three years ago. We all were looking for a bit of a change and we certainly got that when we moved out here. Um, before that, um, I've been a teacher for, um, I lose track a little bit, maybe 13, 14 years or so, something like that. Um, and um, uh, various bits and pieces I've done before that. I was a prison psychologist, for, assistant psychologist for a while and internet editor. Um, and just in the last couple of years, I've started doing some student counselling and what have you. And then um, in a couple of years ago, I, I decided that um, I wanted to do something to, to kind of help what seems to be a growing um, student well-being uh, issue, uh, you know, partly from looking at the national picture, but also um, in some of the, the, the students in front of me and the concerns and what have you. And so I... Uh, came up with an idea for a book and I did a few chapters and sent it off and um, to my surprise was asked to write the book so I did that about a year ago and it was published recently and it's published oh yeah published very soon <laughs> well, published well, already I, probably. I think, yeah, we, we had this discussion before I press record about the fact that I've got a, a big backlog of recordings so we're recording on the 20th of August but this will likely go out in a few weeks time but I think is it not tomorrow in when when we're talking about in real life it now, is I tomorrow think, yeah. yeah tomorrow is your publication day and I have something you don't have yeah. so those of you listening I'm holding up a copy oh, of the book which <laughs> you don't have right <laughs> that's right I've not seen it yet I'm dying to hold one it's lovely I mean I feel like I'm teasing you now like just holding the book here in front of you so um yeah it feels very wrong that i have it before you do is this because uh, it takes a while to to ship out to you in malawi yeah. in the current yeah. context presumably um yeah. so is this your first book yes it is uh it is yeah and um like i said it was one of those things it, it just came out you know when there's a sudden strange burst of creativity and, and all of a sudden um it was over the christmas holidays i suddenly wrote three chapters uh, and um, uh, and they uh, actually you had a little part to play in it as well because I wrote the chapters and um, I was googling publishers I wasn't sure who to try and send it off to and I I put in education publishers publishers and Jessica Kingsley came up um, pretty I think it was the first one that came up and I had a look and there was a big quote from you on their website saying Oh, Jessica and Kingsley are really like a family Aww. and they're really nice and because I knew I'd heard of or, you know I, I was aware of your all of your your work and what have you so I thought well that must be a, a good place to send it so that's that was uh, they were the first that, funny enough they were the first education publisher that I sent it off to and um, and they picked it up which was great oh that's fabulous and oh that's really nice to hear that I played that little part so for context so Jessica Kingsley publishers are uh, well they always were a small independent publishers although they've since been um, kind of bought by Hachette but being they're keeping that uh, independent vibe and um, they are yeah like I said on the website you know that's not that's not just uh, me paying lip service to them they genuinely are like family to me and they've supported me through lots of different uh, kind of book projects but also through quite a lot of stuff in my own life so uh, when I was uh, hospitalized with anorexia then uh, the, the person who was uh, one of my editors at the time would come out and see me and bring me book packages you know because the kind of care packages I like are generally made up Fantastic. of books so, <laughs> so yeah they're fab yeah. absolutely fab so tell yeah. us about the book then because I was really interested to learn about the the concept for this because I'm a big fan of kind of evidence-informed practice and using what we know works and so the book is called 18 well-being hacks for students using psychology secrets to survive and thrive so t tell us about it the concept behind it and, and why you thought it might work yeah well one, one of the things that I found found was when I when I first sort of thought about um, uh, 
self-help type books and psychology based ones and I looked at some and, and, and um, picked a few up what if what struck me was that quite often because psychology is such a broad church and and when you when you specialize in somewhere you become you know you spend a lot of time in that and you become quite passionate about that so you become a cognitive neuroscientist or a you know a, an attachment uh, attachment psychologist or a social psychologist and and what I what I um, found was that quite a lot of the books were from quite a specialist angle where there was there were one or two really really nice good ideas from it but then it was kind of spun out for the whole book um, because that was the it was just from that specific area of psychology and what and it felt like some of them could be condensed down to a chapter and then move on to a completely different area of psychology um, and so that that was really what I wanted to do. And, and I suppose because I'm a teacher of psychology rather than, you know, a, a research scientist in a very specialist area, um, I was kind of a bit more um, used to looking at that broader picture with the, the various different um, angles to it. And it, it was when I look back on it and uh, and it was incredibly I was a bit naive and slightly arrogant to think that that would be a relative that would be a thing that you know any anyone could could really do because um although I've done two degrees in psychology but it was quite quite some time ago and as I was stepping from one area to the next I really felt as though I had to get up to speed with at least roughly where it is now um and so just in that bit of, of getting the context of it took quite some time and then within that I, I, I was just at that point um, I was just then looking for to cherry pick you know the best idea from um, as you say from social psychology and cognitive psychology from neuroscience and psychodynamics and um, all of that so so choosing the, the bits to 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 pick out in terms of um, of the sort of a nice straightforward um, idea for well-being um, wasn't too bad, but I, I really, I, I really wanted to make sure I wasn't kind of really out of date with everything, and and um, so that 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 bit of it, and getting the context, and making sure that it was it was relevant, and um, the research base was was still really with it. Um, that took a long time, so it was it took me a year basically to write the whole thing. Um, but so I mean, like I was working full time. Hit then across all the fields of psychology it's kind of a greatest hits of all the things that young people could use to kind of improve their lives exactly that that's that's a really nice word but that would have been a better title probably <laughs> <laughs> i know i like hacks i like hacks i have anxiety hacks yeah. on my youtube channel and, and and yeah particularly kind of younger people get it just one one question before you maybe dive in and, and explain some of the hacks um their well-being hacks for students a i disagree because i think it's a great book and i've already started using it myself and i'm definitely not a student anymore sadly um but b when you say for students what age range are you actually thinking of there because it's quite an yeah word. yeah no no sure well um because i'm a psychology teacher i mean my my main pitch was was um six form six formers because that's where i'm sort of at um, and the book, so the, the book is really aimed at 16 to 24. So teenagers and young adults, so I'm thinking really kind of, in my mind, it was sixth formers and undergraduates, but obviously there's some, there's some gray area either side of those. And, and as you say, a lot of the, um, a lot of the stuff that we, that, that's, that it, we talk about in the book is pretty much universal, but it's really, it's the way it was pitched. And when we were, when I was, um, it's funny you should bring that up because when I was talking to to the editor about it, we were we were discussing it early on. You know, there was some talk of maybe it should be uh, should it be pitched at um, teachers and adults who are looking after or, or have some you know have a stake in in young people. Um, but it really um, it really was a lot fresher and um, it just come it came across a lot clearer. Talk as though it's just talking directly to um to a young person so we went for that in here but the, what my hope is really that it would be something that um a young person can can access but also uh, as i say a, a, an, an adult um can access and something that might generate conversations because i mean one of the one of the things that triggered it actually was a conversation a late night conversation with a really really old friend of mine whose whose son, um, son was struggling he was in a really, really difficult relationship and 
Um, and whatever the parents seemed to do, it kind of seemed to make it worse. And they, they, they really didn't, you know, they felt out of their depth and what have you. One of the things that I was really hoping that might happen with the book is that it could, it could start um, conversations around a difficult issue rather than going straight in with sort of confrontational things you could kind of come out and say oh look this is this interesting thing here about relationships you know or there's this this you know whatever it might be uh, and so it's that's why it's sort of it's it's directed at the the young people but I'm I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be useful for for a range of people but maybe you know volume two is well-being hacks for teachers who knows <laughs> yeah. You look like you might cry exactly. when I said that. <laughs> I don't want to write. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like that every time I finish writing a book. I, I I've said this to my husband for at least the last three, and I've said it to my editors now. I'm like, I'm not writing any more books. But I hand the manuscript in, and then it's so long from that point until you hold it in your hand, and then you get it, and you're like, Oh, I love it. I can't wait to write another one. <laughs> yeah, just forget. Yeah. I think a bit like having, I think it's yeah. like pregnancy and birth. I think it, it, it's like that with books, you know, pregnant, you get really, really fed up of it. And then as soon as you've got your baby in your arms, you go, oh yeah, <laughs> totally worth it. So, so, okay. So there's, there's kind of a, a different kind of thoughts behind what you were hoping it would do there. And I think that idea that it generates discussion and kind of provides ways in when we might be working with young adults, essentially, is, is a really nice thought, actually. What, which of the hacks are your favorites like which one would you you pick out as your the one you most enjoyed writing about um probably i mean this is a bit of a shame because it's the one that's got the least to do with psychology in fact but um i probably the one about um this one about perfectionism and uh the ancient chart ancient art of kintsuki um which uh which I like because it was, it just kind of, it, 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 it all seemed to, when I just, it was one of those things, I started that thread and then it just kind of really worked all the way through the analogy. And it, it's, um, so Kintsuki is, is uh, um, the, uh, the art of mending ceramics using resin and gold paint in a such a way that you actually accentuate the cracks rather than try to cover them up. Um, there was a shogun in, in, I think it was the, 1400s who had a pot that he really loved and he sent it away to get um uh mended and it came back with metal staples on it he was really displeased and he felt that we could do that uh, they, they, they could do better so he had got his best craftsmen to, to work on a really good way of mending this pot and they came up with that idea um and it's it's used in terms of um, perfection of the perfectionism in as much as the process is very careful in so much as to like to start off with you take a, the broken pieces of a pot and you soften the sharp edges that's the first thing you do um, and there's analogy analogy there with um you know we all feel broken and um, imperfect at times um, and you do need to you need you need you need to soften the, the pain of that and to to seek help and and things uh, and then you, when you're putting it back together with the resin, you have to hold it in place for quite some time. Uh, and there's again, an analogy with the patience that's required sometimes to put yourself back together uh, uh, when you feel broken and, um, and what have you. Uh, but then at the end of it, it's the thing about um, celebrating the cracks because what they do is actually make that piece of pottery unique uh, and beautiful. Uh, and so rather than trying to, well, you know of human nature a lot of the time we try and hide our what we feel is our imperfections and our brokenness um, and the analogy there is to actually um, celebrate some of that because it makes you unique it also it kind of shows that you are like with the pottery um, it shows that this is a piece of pottery that's worth um, repairing um, and that is loved you know, and the fact that um, that it's been put back together, you can see that it's been put but put back together is gives uh, means that it's it has meaning, uh, and uh, all of that kind of helped in a discussion about dealing with feelings of imperfection and dealing with um, feeling broken, uh, and why it's how it can be reversed, and rather than trying to to hide that and be ashamed of it, to celebrate it and to 
um, to see the, the ways in which it, it in which it can show that you've you've uh, you have seen a bit of life you know you've you've dared to get out there and and uh, be knocked around um, and but you're also worth putting back together and those scars and bruises that you've accumulated along the way actually make you unique and beautiful. And why did that feel like an important chapter to include in a book for students? Was there a particular motivation right now or? Well, um, I, yeah, again, maybe both, both kind of statistically and sort of personally speaking from my interest is that it, it seems as though um, perfectionism in, a, in its worst form um, is on the rise uh, and there's lots of different ideas about why that might be mostly it's to do with the fact that increasingly we have a kind of individualistic um, competitive um, culture where um, you're kind of your own brand all the time you, uh, you know you I mean to some extent that's always been you always had to go to job interviews and sell yourself but now it's kind of 24 hours a day uh, you're on LinkedIn, but it's also moved into the social arena. You're a kind of brand on on social media as well as in your professional life. Um, and so th this is, it's not black and white, but there's some thinking that that, that kind of con that, that cultural um, context has to do with why people are less and less uh, able to um, be imperfect and to, to uh, or more and more worried about um, any imperfections uh, of them uh, that, that they might show. Um, and certainly, I know from my own experience in the classroom that um, that it's a very debil debilitating thing, um, even in even in quite a, a, a mild form. You know, I have students who just will will not. Um, want to or I've one or two that simply refuse to kind of give me a draft of a of a piece of work that they're doing um, uh, until they're absolutely sure that it's going to be great which is the opposite way around to what I need because I'm if they send me something that's perfect is I've got no use uh, as a teacher for them, you know so I'm trying to engender you know doing um, drafts and uh, redrafting for a lot of people plus then also the um, you know the extreme pressure that a lot of people put on themselves in terms of grades uh, and that is and that element of perfectionism is that is that your achievements become part of who you are uh, and that is we all know that that's you know that's a that's a, a big issue and, and it feels as though to some extent that's an increasing one and again I think that's to do with that increasing every it seems to keep ranking up the the the, the business of your um, you're in a competition you personally as a person are in a competition with everybody else um for jobs um you know because you're going to have to keep applying for jobs and change careers and do all kinds of things and keep up to speed with everything that's going on um as well as on social media keeping up with um looking amazing and going to fabulous places and having amazing experiences every day um, all of those things together I think can uh, cause that that kind of need to try and appear to be um, as perfect as you can and that's really pressurized. I think it's a really beautiful um a beautiful one to have chosen i'm a massive fan as well of, of kintsugi and uh, it's an analogy that uh, a particular friend of mine will often uh, come back to if i've been through sort of uh, challenging times and i find it a helpful one to think about um, particularly in relation to self-harm scars actually that for me viewing those scars as part of my journey and you know a time when i've survived and and you know part of a an imperfect but unique person is is important i think and, and i think yeah lots of people take different things from it so you said that um that was one of the least psychology e chapters <laughs> another one tell us another one that is, that's very much based in, in in psychology let us know another hack we won't tell them all um, don't worry. i'll make sure people still want to buy the book <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's another one. Uh, the one, another one I quite like about which I haven't spoken about, which, which is about um, social psychology. So, psychology is 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 um, you know uh, as you know is is odd in, in as much as it has um, very uh, fashions come and go. Yeah. 
and social psychology is um, is slightly out of fashion it seems to me at the moment because um, neuroscience is everything social psychology was massive in the 60s and 70s and and um, then it was cognitive now it's all neuroscience and what have you social psychology has seen a little bit as I think as a little bit kind of woolly um, in the context of that and yet it's just you know it's it's so important there's um, uh, there's one which I, I, I call it uh, join or leave a group um, because it's all about social identities and the importance of that and uh, it's important to all of us but you can see how that with with young people that's that's an especially sort of powerful kind of thing um, and uh, in terms of psychology actually what what was interesting to me was that um, I started off with the Milgram experiment which is an absolute classic in psychology which is uh, is about um, um, Milgram was was uh, an American Jew uh, who was interested in in um, the Holocaust and how people seem to be able to carry out um, uh, horrific acts um, and the mantra during some of the war crime tri war crime tribunals was I was just following orders and he wanted to know if you know if you put in a set the correct situation would we all do terrible things if we're ordered to in a certain context and he seemed to prove that you could get people most people to give an electric shock to someone in another room um, just by having somebody standing there ordering them to in a in a, um, a lab coat in a in a context of a prestigious university um, but um, it was professor Stephen Riker um, who's also uh, who also social psychologist um, looked into the data again and um, pointed out that actually in the Milgram experiments most of the, the prompts that were given by the researcher were not actually orders um, the first one was please uh, please can you continue I think it was something like that please continue um, and the second one was it, the experiment requires you to continue which is more of a statement the first one's a request there's only one order which is at the end which is it's uh, was that you have no other choice but you must continue um, and actually nobody um, continued nobody uh, obeyed the actual order at all they oh. went along with the previous ones and um, what so he was reinterpreting professor Reich was reinterpreting that as because it, given that there are no orders here the, the thing about you'll do anything if you're ordered to in the same way that, that the war crimes were carried out didn't really fit and what he pointed out was what Milgram set up was a situation where the participant was uh, in the middle of, of two different things. He had the researcher on one side saying it's, you have to, it's important that you continue with this experiment um, and he had um, somebody in another room who he thought he was giving electric shock to who was screaming at him saying stop I don't want any more to do with this experiment uh, and the, the, uh, the participant had arrived and turned up um, with the purpose of carrying out this experiment and the experimenter was the, the guy who was with him on this business of completing the experiment so um, uh, Professor Riker points out that they had that shared purpose and shared therefore kind of shared identity uh, and that it seems was so powerful that it was overriding um, screams and uh, and cries from somebody who didn't have that shared identity uh -huh. and that shared purpose and what I thought for me what that was it, why that is interesting is because time and time again in schools you have situations that I found I previously found difficult to understand so I use the example of of sexting for example where you have we have young people sending a, a new picture of themselves usually to a boyfriend uh, and it's a disastrous thing to do and everybody can see that it's a it's a disastrous thing to do and we've told uh, you know in schools we've been telling young people that that's a terrible thing to do for many years now um, and it still happens and you think well how can that happen and when you think about it what you've got then is you've got a young person and what are the voices that they're listening to if they are listening to um, their the other people in their social group who they identify with saying this is a normal thing this is what we all do and then you've got a teacher um, getting up in a life skills lesson saying that's a terrible thing to do um, it suddenly becomes a lot more uh, easy to understand why that's going to happen because it doesn't matter how much we 
how much kind of we scream and shout about it. If you make the analogy with the Milgram experiment, you know, that you had a person there that was literally saying, you've got to stop, let me out. This is, you know, you've got to stop doing this. They were, they were really impassioned and it was a life or death situation. Um, and yet the power of listening to somebody who is, who you identify with, who you is, is part of your social group is, seems to be so strong that it will override, you know, the most powerful voices from those outside those groups. And so if you're going to, what, what that said to me is that if you're going to uh, try and, and influence people in terms of well-being and making good decisions, you've really got to work hard at building up, um, you know, rapport, but also maybe trying to, to get the, the voices of the, the messages um, come from other students that you know that, that the students can identify with because it doesn't you know no I think the, the I mean some of that is obvious but you would have thought that if you got up you know as a teacher and you were strong enough and you had enough evidence and you were you know you were powerful enough then you could get through and, and everyone would understand that they mustn't do this um, and it turns out that that's not the case it's all about is is uh, is this a voice from somebody that they identify with, or is it at least um, is it more powerful than other voices that they're listening to? Um, and in terms of the hack for the young people, what I, I mean, because it's a difficult thing um, uh, to you know to to kind of deal with. But one one of the things that seems to me is that what we need to offer is as many social identities as we can. For young people and for, to get young people to understand that they they can so they, they they need to do that so you know if you're if you're if you feel part of many different groups then the voices within any one of, within any one of those groups become a bit less powerful so if there are kind of malevolent voices uh, in one of your groups i think you're going to feel much more empowered to fight against that if you feel like you're that's just one of your social identities and you've got many more um, so it's it, it's really um, advocating, you know, all kinds of clubs and mixing up social groups and friendship groups and um, drama and sports activities and all those kind of things where, where you where you're going to meet different types of people. Um, all of those become uh, become really really uh, really important. Was that where you used the new to me term flextrovert? Is it flextrovert? Flextrovert, yeah. Was that your term, or is that uh, I, I? I'm not aware of that term before. Ooh. Light. I really like the term and I, I really like the way it encapsulated those, those things which are both, which were Sorry, I lost, I lost you for a moment there. So sorry, just get, if you don't, if you don't mind just going back to, so I just asked whether the flextrovert was your term or where it came from and I then lost you. So if you don't mind just repeating, sorry. Yes, sorry, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, 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 no, flextrovert is a, is a term from Professor Karen Pine. Um, and um, she she has come up with the construct of of what that means essentially as a, 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 like a personality trait. It's kind of a mixture of openness and um, version. Um, uh, but a I just really liked the word, and b it kind of gets straight into um, uh, you know straight into uh, that the, the the thing about trying out new things um, and being open to new experiences, which. Um, which seems as to be just a really, really good, uh, good thing for for well-being and something, especially with young people, where you can, you know, they they are anyway um, generally going to be open to new things. But it's a time where you can maybe start to close down a little bit. So fostering that, keeping up, keeping the openness um, going, um, you know, is a really good thing. And of the various hacks in the book, are there any that you use yourself? Because I know you've had your various kind of ups and downs throughout your um, young and adult life. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, uh, I guess the, the ones that I use most um, 
there's a there's a thing that I, I call it combat breathing. Um, most people know it as box breathing, uh, but I just again I thought combat breathing sounded a bit feistier. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's the the really I just love the simplicity of it. The really simple um, breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, rest for a count of four, and and keep going around that and activating the, the parasympathetic nervous system in order to, to calm your body down and then um uh, your your mind will will generally kind of follow with that and uh that's the thing that i've i've used a lot um and i was really proud actually yesterday i was i was in um in my bedroom and i heard my daughters teaching it so my wife and uh, they were they were counting for her and what have you said um, so they're using it too. Um, there is obviously there's um, there's the exercise. I call them exercise snacks. Um, trying to you know the the benefit of even a um, a five minute walk um, you know done regularly uh, is is huge. And I use that um, I, I use that a lot. Um, there's a nature one because uh, uh, about maybe halfway through writing the book. Um, I had a few problems and um, I started writing outside. I started doing much more exercise and I started using the breathing. Um, those, uh, those three, a lot of the stuff about sleep, uh, you know, the being sleep as a, as a kind of bedrock of well-being. So sleep practices like um, trying to keep uh, to routine, cool and dark um, bedroom, um, no screens for 90 minutes before, uh, you need to go to sleep. Stop drinking coffee uh, after midday. Um, stop drinking alcohol, most of all, pretty much altogether. But that's partly because you can't really get very nice alcohol out of here. So I'm hoping to revisit. I'm hoping to revisit wine when I get back to the UK. But but nevertheless, that's helped with the sleep of it. I think. Um, and um, there's another one which I, I which I use not as much as I should, but it's called do almost nothing um, and it's the importance of of uh, of taking some time to do nothing um, it's called do almost nothing because a lot of the research suggests that if you just sit and try and do nothing at all then you can slip into rumination and actually start focusing um, on negative repeated negative thoughts um, so with the nice it's a couple of nice bits of research so if you do some sort of undemanding task like doodling or you know if you're crafty then uh, knitting or anything like that where you, you can do it almost without thinking that's that uh, aimless walking you know as long as you're not trying to get somewhere to so walking be, uh, is, a, is a really nice one um it's it's really good that's another one actually that where uh, there was psychology that i haven't come across before which i thought was really nice so the it, that kind of thing active activates the brain's um default mode which is what your brain does when it's not really doing anything. Um, and it turns out that it's a really, really useful process that your brain goes through. It's basically a kind of daydreaming and, and, and it's really good for creativity and it's really good for identity formation and thinking about who you are and where you fit in the world. So that's also why it seemed especially good for um, a student hack because the problem being that most of the time now we fill up all of those gaps of time that used to this used to happen with picking up a phone and and swiping for a smartphone is absolutely not um, an undemanding task. It's a very focused thing. It's it's purposefully trying to keep you focused in a kind of fra fractured sort of way. Um, so I think the, the doing nothing thing is a is a is an endangered activity and it's it's a shame because it's a really important one um so i try to build i try to build that into my life but it's i'm not as good as i should be with those kind of things because i'm constantly trying to get on with other things it's hard though isn't it i find this that as a parent the things that i expect of my children and the things that i enable for myself often are further apart than i'd like them to be and i think sleep is a really really great example there you know my children are 10 now and i've always always championed the importance of sleep and over lockdown they've mucked around a bit and they've had sleepovers in each other's rooms and sometimes they've not had as much sleep and i've lectured them on it and then i've stopped and i've thought to myself but then i sat up until whatever time 
time in the morning mindlessly scrolling or reading or or what have you and and and, and it's something i have to yeah very purposefully revisit actually um, and and i yeah. think as well some of those things that you mentioned these are the things um for me uh, are always the go-to's when i feel myself beginning to slip if the anxiety is creeping in or the depression is looming then i know you know think about sleep think about food think about exercise get out go walk these simple things often make a huge difference don't they yeah yeah they do um it, which is you just talking about actually for some reason reminded me this um alain de Botton talks quite a lot about um about how well religion does uh, a lot of things in terms of communication he's an atheist but um he's impressed with with it because essentially because in uh you know in religion there's an awful lot of just repeating the same thing because over the centuries um religion is has worked out that you you just need that constant repetition of very simple messages because otherwise even that you know we have great messages and then we forget all about them and and go off and do good you know, and do terrible things so uh, absolutely right it's um it is uh it's about routine isn't it and trying to embed it uh, and and one of the things that i did because I, I was really concerned um as i got towards the end of the book that i didn't want it to be a sort of interesting thing that somebody would look at and then put onto the shelf um, and so i developed an app to go with the book and that's part that was really in, entirely with this in mind with like how is it how could we do something how could we do something that that would make it more likely that that some of these things would would become a, a daily habit so the app is a sort of habit former where it gives you a little you choose which hacks to, to to work on and it gives you a little daily task to um to carry out as a sort of prompt to to try and and do that and embed it into the into your life Oh, wow, I haven't looked at the app. So tell us more about where do we find the app and is it ready and available? And Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's ready and it's free uh, and uh, you, you get it from the App Store or Google Play uh, and it's called WellSense, so well, and then it's S-E-N-Z at the end, so WellSense with a Z on the end. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, free to download and, and I say, I think it's pretty straightforward really when you get onto it, you just choose... Uh, it's not got all of the 18 because they didn't all lend themselves, um, you know, to the hacks. And there's there's so many sleep ha uh, sleep apps and exercise ones, so I didn't put those on there. But there's things like you know the Flextrovert one and uh, and the um, uh, Do Nothing one and um, the, those 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 kind of things where it lends itself a little bit more to giving you a daily prompt and a task um, for it. And what kind of uh, and, age group uh, do you think would be would benefit from using that app? Because I know a lot of the people who are listening to this might be thinking that might be something great to recommend to their students or families. Yeah, I, I mean, for that one, I would have thought any from from secondary school upwards. It's because mm. it's pretty straightforward to use, and it's um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's a simple simple tool. Wow! And did you so you you've done that, and that's a free app. What's in it for you? <laughs> well like i say that for, for me it's it's uh because i really want i really want this book and the ideas behind it to actually have an impact and and for people to use them and that was the you know obviously i was thinking of, of students and i was thinking well you know how do you get in front of a student uh, and a young person uh, and smartphones came to mind even though i've got a whole chapter on how not to get addicted to smartphones but we'll leave that um, leave that aside but, um but yeah it was it was that it was a, a really a, a desire to to actually make it real rather than just a sort of nice theoretical exercise in a book I think I think the other thing you do really well um, and really appeals to my sense of uh, kind of yeah focus and order is that you know exactly what to expect that the the chapters are laid out similarly um, which I like and it's exactly how how I write as well um, but also that you summarize at the end of each chapter so actually you can go through and you can read it in whatever order you want but you can always go back and refresh or if you just want to share you know the basic idea of a chapter um, or work out if it's the right one for right now I particularly found those summaries really helpful helpful and I know from experience of writing that those bits look easy but they're often the hardest bit to do aren't they 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they are because, and you're absolutely right. That because that was a that was a thing again. That was towards the end of the process when I thought exactly as we've just been talking about how you know how is it how is it going to be more easily accessible um and it took ages doing that and and it was a sort of painful process because it, it's so difficult to to figure out what are the key mm. what really are the key messages from that whole yeah. bit of text that's it because i i find that it's very easy to say something in 500 words but very hard to say it in 50 and uh, and you have done that really well i i wondered is this a book that you would have benefited from when you were a student um I'm sure I would have benefited from it. I mean, uh, I don't think I picked up a book that I didn't absolutely have to until I was about 24. So I can't sit here and say that I would have, I would have picked it up and, <laughs> and read it from start to finish and loved every word of it. Um, uh, but um, I also think, um, I mean, uh, I was lucky, you know, I had a, I had a really, um, really excellent kind of upbringing with no real problems and um, and and I feel like the pressures were different then and we you know they, they were uh, obviously there were pressures but I don't remember um, feeling you know full of angst about um, anything I didn't um, uh, I um, uh, and, and there wasn't that kind of you know there wasn't the sort of the, the, the wider culture wasn't discussing it um and it's hard to know i mean i don't know whether or not that means it was just underground or whether it simply wasn't wasn't there uh, as much i'm not I, i'm not at all sure about that but i i mean i was lucky i didn't really have any issues at that point so i if someone had put that in front of me i'd have walked off and picked up my football <laughs> <laughs> and you said in the in the notes that you shared with me beforehand that when you were younger your hopes were to become uh, a rock star um which strikes me as similar to one of my daughters wants to become a famous youtuber and that um i'm not suggesting the two are the same but i think that you know we're, we're of a slightly different generation to my girls and um that perhaps it's one of those things that maybe the adults in your life might have seen similarly to me seeing Ellie's aspirations. I don't know, or perhaps, or were you a very gifted musician? I, I... Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, my parents, um, uh, they didn't know what to make of that. Um, uh, and um, luckily, I mean, not luckily, this sounds terrible, but I, they, they moved to London while I was at sixth form and I, I lived, moved in with another family. Um, and so I was, uh, I was kind of slightly distant from. I think they just kind of, um, I think they washed their hands of of that whole thing because it was. Uh, uh, my dad was a was a Anglican vicar, um, and um, so rock star, Anglican <laughs> vicar. You know, I don't think he he didn't really know what to do with it. Um, uh, so they left me to it really, um, and it never happened. But but. I don't at all regret it. I've had that thread of music. I, I spent basically four years, really, in a way, trying to properly trying to be a rock star, or at least being a, a rock musician. And um, uh, and it's uh, a. It was you know I think it was it was it was a worthwhile thing to have a go at. Um, but it, as I say, it stayed with me throughout my life. Oddly enough, this is the way that these things kind of work. Um, last uh last year i um was i released my first album um because um just before coming out to malawi um there were a group of of um dads who all had children in the uh local primary school and we would get together and play just just jam and what have you uh and we got picked up somehow by uh, the bbc on a program called the uk's best part-time band and and we were on uh, I was, ended up playing at um, the Scala in London uh, and to about a thousand people. Uh, it was one of the scariest things that I've ever done in my life because uh, playing live is one thing, but at least if you, it's in the moment and if you make a mistake, it's all over. But playing live when you've got TV cameras on you seemed like the worst of all worlds because you have the whole live thing. But then if you make a mistake, it's there for everyone to see. Uh, but it was also great fun. Um, and out of that, we crowdfunded an album, and we sold them. So, you know, it, it's you never know when these when these things are gonna are gonna 
uh, uh, come to fruition in a way. And also just so playing cool. guitar has always been a, 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 a great, lo lovely sort of threat. I mean, the kids, if you can imagine at secondary school, um, every now and then there's a, a teacher band or something and you whip out the electric guitar and, and, uh, uh, and, and let a lead break go. And they just, uh, they, they love it. They think it's great seeing an old granddad playing. Play, play some, <laughs> some rock guitar. I think it's awesome. I, so I it's, think that's amazing. I think that's, that's absolutely brilliant. And I think it's really fab that you did, you know, you, you were bold and brave and, and took that opportunity to, to do the scary stuff and, 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 and get up and, and, and do it and give it a go um, when the opportunity presented itself. So I think that is one of the things that sometimes when you look back on your life, then people will often say, well, I was very lucky because. But I think there is a certain extent, and I don't know, maybe you, you'd have a view on this as a psychologist, that we kind of make our own luck about whether we're open to opportunity sometimes even, isn't it? And, and whether we're prepared to then give it a go and, and, and be a bit brave and, and go with that. Yeah. And I mean, in a sense, it goes back to the flexure budget thing, isn't it? In, in that if you, if the, it just, it's just kind of makes sense that if you're open to more ex experiences, then some of them are going to work and, and also you have more options to, drop things that are not working and you know to pick up that and be more sort of adaptable um to it so yeah there's certainly um there's certainly a lot with that yeah because i've certainly found that sort of through my um career that i i often find that you know i'm i'm really lucky in the opportunities that seem to to present themselves but then you know i do work hard and i speak to lots of different people all the time and i try to be helpful and so i suppose it's kind of you know it's perhaps somewhat inevitable that opportunity does every now and then come along that's the right one um but yeah i don't know yeah. I, I get asked this quite often by uh, if i go and uh, talk in in schools to to young people which i do less i mainly work with the teachers but if i talk to young people there'll always be at least one or two or say how do i get to do what you do when i grow up and i always think i have no idea <laughs> not a clue <laughs> so it's <laughs> what um what what, what yeah. um it, was it that inspired yeah, you to, no to, to, to Malala? Well, um, it, it was, uh, as I say, it was really, um, I mean, because I have done quite a few different things in my professional life. Uh, you know, I've not been a teacher all my life. And so I think um, having been a teacher for 10 years or so, you know, it was, it was quite odd for me to still just be doing the same thing. Um, and, uh, I really needed a change or I, I felt like it was, I was in danger of becoming, um, uh, you know, a bit sort of, uh, rusty in that respect, in that sense. So, um, uh, that was it for me. I mean, I was lucky that, um, both my daughters and also my wife, um, were also interested in in um, mixing it up and 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 giving that a go. Um, I feel kind of guilty at times because we dragged my elder daughter out um, right in the middle of her GCSEs, so she had to do her GCSEs out here in one year, uh, and but she did fine. Um, and then my younger one was okay. Uh, and um, yeah, we were just all looking for a, for a, a change, and it's been. To be honest with you, it's been really tough. Um, uh, it's been much harder than I thought. I, I was a bit naive. Um, we thought that we would come out and our, our main aim was really to kind of get to know local people and to kind of get involved in the culture. Um, and that's been harder than, it, than I thought it would be, not through any fault of anyone's, but the... Um, uh, there's there's not very much tourism here um so if you go even to in in the center i'm in blantyre which is you know pretty big city but even if you get just to the edge of of that um being a white person is quite a big deal uh and so um you're kind of almost instantly a celebrity and and, and a sort of a thing of of interest and an attraction um, and what that means is that having a human connection becomes very difficult. If you know what I mean, it's, it, you, you can't, what you want to, I just want to be wandering around and seeing what's going on and having the occasional chat with somebody. But actually, as soon as you're, you're out in, in, um, 
role model, aren't we? So to, for, for, for sure, it's a, it's a big deal, you just being there. And also, because I'm really shy, and so I, that, well, kind of, I mean, I'm certain, shy in certain situations, that kind of situation uh, kind of makes me really uncomfortable to some extent. I mean, it's really nice having, you know, you tend to get children coming up and, and adults kind of staring at you and, and you know, they're really friendly and lovely. It's, it, but it's just, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't allow for that kind of, uh, for me so far, for that kind of um, easy human connection. Um, and that's been kind of difficult. It, it makes me think of, um, I interviewed last week, um, a really inspiring a uh, woman called Charlotte who has cerebral palsy and she spoke quite similarly about how people never look beyond her disability and the whole thing we were talking about was how she's actually a really fantastic writer but she always feels like she has to really excel and overachieve to be seen as credible because she thinks that people say oh well you're a good writer for someone with a disability and that it's it's really hard that wherever she goes she takes her disability with her and that's what people see first and it, it feels a bit like maybe you're whiteness is like that in Malawi yeah yeah that's the, no that's a really that's really interesting and I, I'd yeah I'd, I'd not I, I wouldn't have I've put this in together but I can I can see exactly why uh, exactly how how that might be and again it, it's it, it's all of that kind of thing of of anything that that interrupts just just a, a kind of as a you say, just a human connection in that way yeah Wow. Well, I'm, I'm aware of time and so we, we should probably draw to a close, but I wondered what would be the thought you would like to leave everybody with? What would be your final thought? Uh, one thought? Yeah. Um, um, I think I would, I would just to go with, into the, the well-being thing, um, I would just go back to sleep you know when the the all of all the things that i looked into in terms of psychology um the the mo the amazing things that are coming out especially now through neuroscience and being able to look at what's going on while we sleep um it's just incredible and and sleep is just this amazing thing that is um designed personally for you to boost your own immune system in the exact way that it needs to be boosted at that particular point in time and also, the, the, it has this amazing um, uh, um, things that are to do with emotion. Um, so that, for example, um, if you've had a really troubling experience, um, gradually through REM sleep and dreaming, what happens, what seems to happen is that um, you gradually detach the painful emotion from the memory. Um, which makes you able, more able to kind of think back and, and to process it. But also it, it um, fine tunes your ability to read expressions and to, to um, deal with emotional experience in the future. Um, which, so those are two of the, I think, less obvious things, or maybe perhaps less well-known th known things about sleep. Um, and, and also that what's nice about that is that it's, that's changed a lot since I first started teaching. You know, when I first started teaching, students were always interested in dreaming but we didn't really know what it was for which is crazy because we do so much of it and it uses up so much energy it's obvious that it must be really important but to, and to not know really what that was about is just um, it's just crazy and neuroscience is really beginning to unpick that and it has a lot to do like i say with um processing emotional experiences sorry this is way longer than one thought but so my thought would be um sleep eight hours a uh, minimum of eight hours uh, of sleep per night is the bedrock of everything else of all other well-being i think um and so all of the other stuff if you're not if you're not really focusing on sleep then all of the other stuff is going to be not uh not going to fall into place as well as it might mm -hmm.